Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks indeed for the opportunity to speak to you today about this important issue which is gaining a lot of global attention and global concern, which is the rise of economic inequality. And so we're moving from a very specific, very interesting example there in the first presentation to this bigger picture of what is this phenomenon of global uh, economic inequality. So there's six parts to my briefing and I'm going to introduce each of those in turn as we go through. First up, what is economic inequality? It's typically measured as inequality in the distribution of income uh, and less commonly as inequality in the distribution of wealth. Not every country has those statistics. The Gini coefficient is a summary statistic that shows the overall level of inequality in a given country. A score of zero indicates perfect equality. A score of one, sometimes 100, indicates perfect inequality when one person has all the, the income. Other commonly used metrics include the ratio between the average income of the top 20% versus the bottom 20%, uh, or similar quantile ratios, as they're called. And more recently, uh, tax authority data has been examined in a number of countries to show the absolute income share held by different groups in society, such as, for example, the income share of the top 10% or the top 1%. In my own work, uh, I would argue that we need a more holistic definition of economic inequality, which would take account of things like the value of public services, the effects of indirect taxation, a more nuanced approach to family composition and dependencies, uh, and also differences in what it takes to meet the cost of a, of a decent standard of living. So overall, I argue that has to be understood as inequality in the distribution of net economic benefits, and I'll come on to that towards the end. But just looking first of all at the Gini coefficient, economic inequality is increasing across the Western world. Uh, in 2013, the Gini coefficient for the UK was 0.523 or 52.3 for market incomes. That is incomes from all forms of market activity, employment, rental income, uh, dividends and so on. The Gini coefficient was significantly lower at 34.1 when the effect of taxes and social transfers, like pensions and other welfare payments, are taken into account. Now, in 1975, the Gini coefficient for the UK was 26.9. So we see already, just looking at the UK, there's a comparison between what it was in the 70s and what it is after tax today. There's been a significant rise there. But what the, the figure overall shows, this is for all OECD countries for the year 2013, and it shows Gini coefficient in these red and white chimney stack kind of columns here. That's market inequality in each of those countries. Uh, it's unsurprisingly higher than net uh, Gini, which is indicated by the blue columns. So, and I've ordered this uh, diagram on the basis of the, the net inequality which you see in the blue and that curve there. So, this demonstrates several things. First of all, the welfare state is alive and well. As you can see, market inequality drops significantly in almost all OECD countries when you take into account the effects of tax, but particularly social, social transfers, welfare payments and pensions and so on. However, OECD countries vary considerably in the extent to which their markets generate inequality in the first place and the extent to which their welfare systems counteract that inequality. The UK here is one of the most unequal countries in the OECD when it comes to the market distribution of income. The welfare state does make income inequality significantly lower, but the UK still remains the most unequal European country in terms of net income inequality, with only Israel, the United States, Turkey and Chile uh, having lower, sorry, having higher rates of uh, net inequality after the effects of the welfare system. The next diagram here, I have two figures. I'm looking at this one first of all here at the top. Um, I'm looking at select OECD countries, Denmark, Germany, Ireland, the UK and the United States. And it's illustrating the rise, which I talked about earlier, from the 1970s of net Gini coefficient has been rising. There's an overall curve. Some ups and downs, particularly in the UK uh, and in the Republic of Ireland here a dip. But on the whole, there's an upward trend across all of the OECD countries. And this is associated with market liberalization and aspects of global change, sorry, global trade and technology change. 
A different type of data is shown here. Here we're getting onto the tax authority data um, taken from national tax authorities to show the actual income share held uh, by different groups. In this case, um, we're looking at the top 10% income share. For four of them, the exception here being Denmark, there's been a very steep rise in the income share held by the top 10%. This is a longer timeline. We're beginning here in 1891 for some of this data, and you can see the Second World War is here, 30 years of relatively low income inequality, followed by this rise of the share of the top 10%. In the United States, the top 10% now take more than half of all market income, just over 50%, and that level of inequality was last seen in 1939. In the United Kingdom, it's, uh, the top 10% take 39.1% of all market income, compared to 27.8% in 1975. Using an analogy of the uh, set of nested Russian dolls, the matryoshka, uh, it helps to understand the way in which the distribution of income and wealth and the dynamics there have changed due to our analysis of tax data. This is information that's not apparent in the standard Gini coefficient because it's based on survey data. So it's only more recently we've seen these larger studies of tax authority data. And what we see is not only does the top 10% have a disproportionately larger share of income and wealth, but within that group, the top 1% has a disproportionately large share. Within the top 1%, it's the 0.1 who has the lion's share. Within that group, the 0.01 and so on. To the extent that a small number of multi-billionaires are identified as having the same wealth as the population of whole countries. Uh, indeed, in Oxfam's latest campaign, they identify eight people who have the same wealth as half of humanity. So one risk with this in economic terms is a return to what economist Thomas Piketty uh, here in his book Capital in the 21st Century calls patrimonial capitalism. For most of human history, wealth was held in very few hands, which one of the effects of that was very low levels of economic growth and very low levels of innovation in economic history, as well as widespread deprivation. Only since the Second World War has there been widely shared prosperity, along with greatly accelerated technical progress and higher levels of economic growth. So there's a risk for the current economic system that we may be moving back into a period of sort of sclerotic uh, growth associated with the concentration of wealth in few hands. As illustrated here, this is the wealth share of the top 1% in this diagram here. Uh, the top 1% in the United States now has 40% of all wealth. And again, that level last pertained in the 1930s. Uh, in the UK, the top 10% in black here has a lower level, around 20% of all wealth, which is explained for by home ownership uh, and, and other trends in the UK, pension funds in particular. Um, but nonetheless, even in the UK, there is an upward trend towards a greater concentration of wealth inequality. Various studies have shown a strong relationship between society's level of income inequality and a range of social and health problems. And we've seen examples of that in the earlier presentation. So the spirit level is a study by epidemiologists, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, which shows a strong correlation between inequality and worse outcomes in a whole range of, of social issues such as life expectancy, uh, maths and literacy, infant mortality, homicide, imprisonment, teenage births, trust, obesity, uh, mental illness, including addiction, and social mobility. In another example, this report here in 2008, uh, Professor Sir Michael uh, Marmot was asked to chair an independent review of health inequalities in England and to propose evidence-based strategies to reduce the level of uh, health inequality. I think that very much speaks to the, the earlier presentation. So the key messages coming out of his report include the fact that there's a social gradient in health. The lower a person's social position, the worse we're likely to see in terms of health outcomes. Health inequalities result from social inequalities, and therefore action on health inequalities also requires action across the social determinants of health. Focusing solely on the most disadvantaged areas will not reduce health inequalities sufficiently, 
Actions need to be universal, according to the Marmot Report, but with a scale and intensity proportionate to the level of disadvantage. So he coins this term proportionate universalism, so that there would be a universal uh, approach, but some targeting within that to areas of greatest disadvantage. They argue in the report also that action which is taken to reduce health inequalities will benefit society in a number of ways, not least in the economy, in terms of reducing losses from illness associated with health inequalities, uh, increasing productivity, uh, improving tax revenue, lowering expenditure and wealth payments, uh, welfare payments, sorry, and lowering the cost of treatments. So there's a, a linkage there between the, the economic impact of improving health inequalities. On the economic side, in terms of implications, there's been three major OECD reports and a team in the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the big international think tank based in Paris. And they've demonstrated the rise of income inequality and poverty, not least based on a growing wage gap between employment at the top and the bottom of the labor market in terms of good jobs and poorer jobs or precarious jobs. They've done detailed econometric analysis which confirms for the first time in, in that scale that income inequality is dragging down economic growth. And this has major implications for economic policy. Not least, the OECD confirms that a trickle-down effect from the wealthy to the rest of society does not occur. Um, and there's no necessary trade-off between policies that encourage equality and policies that encourage economic growth. On the contrary, they argue that we need to have both. And their Secretary General um, noted the urgency of the situation by talking about a tipping point having been reached with income inequality at the highest level ever recorded across the OECD countries as a whole. In another piece of research here by IMF officials, although not actually a publication of the IMF itself, there's a strong link between income inequality, private sector debt and finance, financial instability. The importance of this is that greater inequality may lead to more boom and bust cycles in the economy with the risk of more frequent and more intense economic crises such as we saw in 2008. Um, so there's an inherent instability in the global economic system brought in by this rise of inequality. In preparing this presentation, I wanted to bring in this idea of a complex social problem, sometimes called a, a wicked problem. Um, it's a technical term. Former US Vice President Al Gore has developed a, a sort of a por portfolio of activities that explain the complex phenomenon of climate change uh, through public presentations and other work that he's done, not least the, the documentary film An Inconvenient Truth, now uh, 10 years, 11 years old. So in a similar way, economic inequality is technically a complex social problem. It implies that it's, it's simply complicated. It's, there's many, many variables involved. We can't just boil it down to the distribution of cash income, but we have to bring in a, a lot more aspects of the issue, which involves a lot of data, a lot of modeling. When you bring in The Economist, you get a lot of jargon that goes with it. Um, but the, the implication, as I think we've seen earlier through the OECD reports and the, and the other examples, is that there are major effects on society and economy and knock-on effects in a lot of ways that might not have been anticipated and certainly were not anticipated uh, in the 1980s or 1990s in terms of what was orthodox economic policy. So the, if we're going to tackle economic inequality, it means we're going to have to really spread out responsibility. It's not just something for uh, tax and social welfare payments. It's something that needs to be spread out across all government departments. And again, as we saw earlier, the importance from a health context of health professionals being able to deal with some of the social determinants, such as deprivation. So the complexity involved in uh, economic inequality is particularly obvious if we use the definition I'm suggesting, which is that economic inequality is the distribution of net economic benefits. So for example, if we take into account the value of public services, the impact of indirect taxes, uh, diversity of family composition and dependencies, not least with divorce, remarriage, merging together of families, also an aging population, 
the dependency structures can be very complicated in a way that's not captured in our income inequality data, which is modified slightly to take account of household size. Um, likewise, different capacities that households have, including the effects of disability and increasing the cost of living, are other factors we need to take into account. So, for example, a household, we might see in statistics, have maintained their income. But their leisure time may be eroding, their ability to engage in care work or care duties or parenting may be eroding, um, they may see their public services decline, and they may have fears about their future retirement or their, their job stability. But all of this is invisible if we only look at income inequality statistics, so we need to broaden out to a wider, a wider range of data. So coming into the, the policy implications then, and in particularly for Northern Ireland, understanding economic inequality as a, a complex social problem, a multi-part, multi-cause issue, helps to, I think, frame the policy solutions and show how every department has to engage in, in some policy actions to, to take on the issue of inequality. So it's clear that income distribution uh, is linked to health and social problems. The effects of income inequality on economic growth imply that this, again, is, is, is no longer or should no longer be perceived as a partisan political issue, but it's a technical effect on the economy which every party has to take account of if they want to achieve sustainable economic growth going forward. There's a need to move beyond a narrow focus on just after-tax household income or sort of the focus on cash and to have more sophisticated public value accountancy is one of the frameworks people are developing to try and understand the value of public services, the value of the community voluntary sector, um, and how they can counteract economic inequality and deprivation. And this links to the idea of a joint up and outcomes based public policy, which again was an idea in the last draft programme for government in Northern Ireland. So there's two examples I want to give of, of policy prescriptions. The first from the IMF uh, director, uh, Christine Lagarde, speaking only in April of this year. She made several suggestions. Firstly, that when the benefits of growth are, are shared more broadly, economic growth is stronger, more durable and more resilient. She notes that technology has been the major factor behind the relative decline of lower and middle skilled workers' incomes in recent years, uh, less so trade. And there's concern that autom automation, of course, the, the rise of robots and artificial intelligence, will progressively jeopardise employment growth in emerging and developing economies, as well as in the developed economies where we already see that effect. So she argues for a greater emphasis on retraining, vocational training, job search assistance, and so on, for those affected by labour market dislocations, but also a commitment to lifelong learning, a workplace training, online courses, and so on. And she argues that today's policies should not disadvantage future generations who would be left to pay for uh, any impu imprudent actions, such as a damaged environment, dilapidated infrastructure, and, and high public debt. So that's perhaps a, a more conservative line from the IMF, but nonetheless um, recognising that the, the income of the top 1% has grown three times faster than the income of everybody else in the population. And even at IMF level, there's, they're responding to what they see as a, an unprecedented situation in the global economy and in member economies. Coming back to the Marmot report on solutions to health inequalities, um, the recommendations there include giving every child the best start in life, enabling all children, young people and adults to maximise their capabilities to have control over their lives, creating fair employment and good work for all, ensuring a healthy standard of living for all, creating and developing healthy and sustainable places and communities, and strengthening the role and impact of the prevention of ill health. And I think that very much links to the kind of multifaceted agenda and policy responses that we need to see from the first presentation. And beyond that, I, uh, as a good academic, have to echo the call for the need for, for better data and better analysis of data, uh, particularly if we're going to take a more holistic approach to economic inequality, to be able to really take this kind of multi-dimensional approach in more detail, drilling down, for example, into time use uh, and how time, uh, available time for care work or parenting may have decreased over time. We simply don't have the surveys that allow us to look at that as accurately as we would want to. And there's many other areas where we don't have uh, sufficient data. Um, crucially, when we begin to look at solutions to economic inequality, it's not all about cash. 
It's not all about just taxing more to pay more welfare. Uh, quite the contrary, we need to have this holistic focus on the value of public services in people's lives, the, the small interventions that can make a very large difference in increasing people's capacities, their ability to sort themselves out of a situation. And of course, different people um, respond differently to different interventions. So there's quite a variety of um, policy opportunities if we're going to tackle economic inequality. So I'll stop there, but I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.